percent of the total 4,000 jobs at the peak of construction would actually be going to skilled foreign workers. The president of Pacific Northwest LNG Project says this is not an exercise in cost savings, but simply it, quote, comes down to the ability to source Canadian labour. And where Canada comes up short is in numbers and expertise. In fact, a new report out says that if construction on this project on the terminal starts on time in 2015, it will be competing against Alberta's oil sands for workers. So that gives you some perspective of the lack of skilled workers, uh, perhaps on this side of the country. Keep in mind, though, that this is just one of 18 proposed LNG projects. If they're having issues finding enough labour here in Canada, you can bet that the 17 others will have some problems too, Michael. All right, thank you, Deirdre. Uh, Debosa uh, joining us uh, from uh, Vancouver. For further perspective on what Canada needs to do to address the skill shortage, we turn to the president of Randstad Canada, Tom Turpin, joins us now. Tom, good to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Before we go any further, do you find that it's an accurate assessment that we simply don't have enough skilled Canadians to do the job that we need to bring foreigners into the country? Absolutely. There are Canadians that are uh, that have the skills to do it, and some are available, but in general, there's absolutely a shortage, without question. Why do we have a shortage in the first place? Is it, Mama, don't let your babies grow up to be oil field services workers? Uh, well, you know, I mean, we're a relatively small country, and we have a, a relatively small labour market, and these tend to be very large projects with very specific skill sets required. So do we have the necessary educational system in place to actually bring uh, Canadians into that industry or is it a case of the, the universities, the colleges, the, the, the skill set just doesn't exist at the educational level to get Canadians up to speed? So that's part of it. Part of it's also just history within the country. You know, a lot of these projects are relatively new, speaking compared to, say, Malaysia or Japan, where there's much more expertise in it. So it's not necessarily that organizations, or sorry, the educational system isn't creating those people now, but now is actually a bit late for the needs of these specific projects. So we also have foreign workers um, being curtailed in this country, the, the tightening of that program by the federal government. What kind of damage does that do to the industry that needs these people? Yeah, it can be pretty tough. And again, I think that, you know, to have a program that curtails in general is a very dangerous thing. To look where there are abuses and where there are excesses, and certainly there are, as there are in all countries, that's fine. But to look and create a blanket policy, I think would be a very, very dangerous thing. Because it's not only oil and gas, there are other industries that have shortages as well. IT has shortages, well, the whole, the whole STEM um, group, right? Uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. There's a shortage in all of them. So with that said and done, though, just to come back to what Petronas needs to do right now, it's a very specialized skills shortage that we're dealing with here. Right. Putting a kid through school today isn't going to solve the problem on the whole. Um, aside from the foreign temporary workers program being expanded, what's the solution? Well, I think there's a bunch of things. I think it's not only temporary workers. I think it's uh, immigration. We need to continue to work with the schools and drive education into uh, skilled workers in general, not only skilled labor, but again, into all the STEM programs. Mm -hmm. And also to make sure that we continue to uh, allow immigrants to come who have the skills we need in the country. The uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, recently came out to say that not only do we have a skill shortage, but we have a problem getting people who do have the skills to the areas at which they need to be. How do we resolve that other than promising to pay for their shipping of all of their products and their, their couches? Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of things, right? It's a, that's a, a recruiting effort. We really do have to be good at selling ourselves organizationally and selling our brand as a country, selling our brand in our, in our uh, different regions. You know, to that point, lots of people that come to Canada come from southern climates these days. They're gonna, we're going to send them to some of their most, most remote, coldest climates in the world. So we have to convince them that the cold weather is good for the soul? Yeah, exactly. I think we have to convince them that Canada is a fantastic place to live and a fantastic opportunity, not only for themselves, but for their kids. That brings it back to the, the, the federal government, does it not? Brings it back to the federal government, but it also brings us back to industry. Industry has to do the same thing. It's industry that operates in those locations. Brings it back to my industry. We're in the recruiting business. We have to make sure that we're selling our brand. It really, it's, it's the onus is on all of us, not just the government. As a recruiter, what is the most difficult sell job you have to give, outside from the prospect of three and a half feet of snow? Yeah, you know, that's a tough one, actually. Uh, location is challenging. People come, they look at where, where economic centers, where their kids gonna, not only are they gonna stay and work themselves, but where the kids gonna move to when they're done. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of societies you know, are very, very close to their children. They live together, they grow together even into adulthood. That's a little bit of a different culture here. 
you know, to move to a place where you may work, but your child may not work, it's a tough sell. What about the sell job of convincing oil field services workers to cross the street? You know, as Deirdre Bosa had been telling us a little bit earlier, right. if Petronas got the, the green light to start construction in 2015 on this LNG project, they would be competing for oil field services workers with the oil sands. In that battle, right. who wins? Right, well, you know, it's interesting. So whoever sells their brand the best, pay is certainly part of that. Whoever has the most attractive overall package, sometimes whoever offers permanent employment to people for people that are looking for that as well. So, it, you know, the person that wins is the person who does the best job. What's the, the best pay packet for someone in this space? If it's not, I can imagine, if it's not just about money, what is it also about? Yeah, it's about lifestyle. It's about family. It's about working in a place where you believe that you can grow, that you've got a future. Uh, uh, depending on the country people come from, a lot of people from different, uh, different parts of the world look for stability actually above pay. Mm. So it really depends on on the demographic that you're looking for and, and who you're trying to bring in. How much is an oil field and services worker getting these days? Uh, lots. They're well paid. They're some of the highest paid folks in the country for sure. Good to have you with us, Tom. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Uh, Tom